Our scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what really matters, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm thankful that I have a healthy family. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old, and just that when I come home, and we're, we're all together, and we're happy, and, and I'm, I'm thankful that I'm able to provide for them and uh, hopefully give them a life of opportunity. What are you thankful for? I'm thankful that every day we get to wake up and have another chance to have a good day. A life. Oh, uh, I work for uh, I I just go my past. I am very thankful for good health uh, for uh, my my entire family. It was a rough year last year, and so I'm incredibly thankful for good health. I'm thankful for pizza and ice cream. What are you thankful for? I'm thankful for my brother and my dad. Uh, baseball. Uh, a family and very good at playing at beating levels on Kirby. I'm really good at Kirby. I am so thankful for my church family and my family and my friends and my community that has surrounded me with love and compassion this year. I'm thankful for many new music writing and publishing opportunities. What are you thankful for? I'm thankful for my family. Um, I'm thankful for my teacher. Gosh, so many blessings, but I'd say um, my number one blessing is that I found Stonebridge United Methodist Church. I've lived in Stonebridge for almost 30 years, and I recently attended here and joined and renewed my baptism here, and it's been an absolutely wonderful experience. Um, I've joined the Sanctuary Choir, which makes it even better, and I'm very, very thankful for the folks here at Stonebridge United Methodist Church. that video is a reminder of both how cute kids can be and how incredible it is to say thank you. We do have so much to be thankful for, and yet life is also full of hard times. The question for us is how well do we deal with those hard times? Dear Abby, a popular national columnist for years, received this letter concerning happiness. Dear Abby, happiness is knowing that your parents won't almost kill you uh, if you come home a little late. Happiness is having your own bedroom. Happiness is having parents that trust you. Happiness is getting the telephone call you've been praying for. Happiness is knowing that you're, well, you're as well dressed as anybody. Happiness is something that I don't have. Signed, 15 and unhappy. A few days later, dear Abby received a response to this 15-year-old letter. This one came from a 13-year-old. It said, Dear Abby, happiness is able to walk. Happiness is being able to talk. Happiness is being able to see. Happiness is being able to hear. Unhappiness is reading a letter from a 15-year-old girl who can do all these things and still says she isn't happy. I can talk. I can see, I can hear, but I can't walk. Signed, 13 and happy. I would hope that all of us would be able to say that we are blessed, that we are happy, truly happy. There are those in this room that have faced life's deepest tragedies. We all at one time or another have Face the deep, dark valley of shadows, have seen the dark night of the soul. Giving thanks and showing gratitude 
in every situation is a choice, both that which is happy and that which is not so much. In fact, studies have shown that gratitude can be learned. The more we practice gratitude, the clearer our sight becomes to the sweet moments of life, the greater our awareness of the blessings of life, the more we show gratitude, the more we see. And in addition to that, what we've learned is that those who are gracious in their gratitude and practice it on on a regular basis are better able and more prepared to handle the unexpected difficult times in life. Yes, giving thanks is a choice. It is a choice that we will make this Thursday. When I look at the passage that I read from Philippians, I marvel at the joy and gratitude that Paul shows in the words of this letter. The entire letter drips with joy and gratitude, his love for the people at Philippi. But Paul didn't live a charmed life. His life had been hard and unfair. As he writes this letter, he has every reason to complain and give up. He had previously watched his brothers and sisters in the faith persecuted and martyred. He had suffered beatings, unjust arrest, torture, and imprisonment. Yet in his final days, he writes this letter to the church at Philippi, his favorite church, by the way, from the bowels of the worst prison in the Roman Empire, awaiting his execution. He writes a letter with thanksgiving, grace, and love. So what is the secret of Paul's uh, joy? I think it's revealed in the prayer that he prays for the church at Philippi there in 9 through 11. For from the moment of Paul's conversion on the Damascus road, Paul began the journey from an embittered, angry, judgmental prosecutor of Christians to a Christ-like offering of love and grace. How was Paul changed? In the short prayer that he offers for the people of Philippi at the beginning of his letter to Philippi, we see that Really, it is love that changed him. And that gratitude and thankfulness comes out of love. It increases in love. He says there, and this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with the knowledge and, f- and full insight. In, in verse 9, Paul prays that their love may overflow in knowledge and insight. But Paul is not just speaking of love as a feeling that we often speak of love. In fact, the Greek word translated here, love, is a love that is willing to sacrifice everything for another. Agape love, sacrificial love. Love no matter what. And when he refers to love overflowing in knowledge and full insight, this is not head knowledge or insight. This is what comes out of the heart. It is a changing of the heart. It is deeper than just thinking. It goes to the very core of our our being. That you may so love in the knowledge and insight. In the Greek, Paul describes the full heart experience of love and a willingness to offer all of ourselves to another. And here's the deal about agape love. It is not blind. It does not overlook faults or weaknesses in others, but sees them clearly. But it looks beyond the faults, the difficulties, the challenges to the heart of things and still continues to love. In other words, God's love is placed in us not to be limited by human standards. It is a love that brings gratitude and opens our eyes to the sweetness of life. And the more we share and experience that love, the more it increases. He continues on in verse 10 by talking about the nature of that love. He says, to help you determine what really matters so that on the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless. 
The Greek word translated pure and blameless is a, it's an interesting word. We only find it twice in the New Testament. It's difficult to translate. It's made up of two Greek words, one that means sunlight and the other that means to judge. The word literally would mean, therefore mean sun tested or sun judged. The word it probably comes from a practice that second-rate sculptures would use in, in, in making sculptures. They would ordinarily get blemished or imperfect marble to work with. And in order to do so and to make it look decent, they would fill in the cracks with wax and paint over the blemishes in order to make the sculpture look correct. But when the sculpture stood in the sun, the, mel- the wax would melt away the paint would crack and fall away, and it would show all of its imperfections. Thus, a sun-tested sculpture was a sculpture that had stood the test of time and the sun, or in human terms, to be free from pretense. If this is the case, sun-tested was to stand in the light of God's truth in the judgment with no need to hide or to conceal our thoughts and desires. In Ephesians 5, 8, Paul says this. He says, to live like those who are at home in the daylight. In spite of our worst moments and our faults, because of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, we can so stand in the sun. We are sun-tested, not because of what we have done, but what has been done for us. A love that is transparent, sincere, and without blame. And Paul goes a step further in this prayer. He prays that their, their love would be deep and abiding, that it would be tested by the, by the elements of this life. But it also bears a harvest. He says, and having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. For Paul, righteousness... We often think of righteousness as a moral and ethical imperative, a set of rules and and precepts to follow. But for Paul, righteousness was a right relationship with God. And the only way to get that right relationship with God was not on our own, but through Jesus Christ. Therefore, the harvest of righteousness was the result of of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He knew the work of the Spirit in his own life and knew that that Spirit can produce within us what is beyond us, the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul's prayer for Philippi is for us as well as for the church at Philippi. It's for all Christians. It's for all of those who want to give thanks in the hardest of times. It's for all of those who want to experience the full nature of God's love and what it can do for us, to be sun-tested, to make a difference in this world. And when we do that and receive that, we can do no other than give thanks and rejoice, as Paul does in this letter. So what does this mean to us, this prayer that Paul prays? For when it's going well, it's easy to give thanks. But what happens when it's not going well? Is it possible to give thanks even then? In Philippians, Paul is not saying that we should ignore the heartaches of life, that we should be a Pollyanna of some kind or another. He's not saying to ignore our regrets, our griefs, our loss, or our disappointments. The question for us is, what will rule our life? Will the hard moments drag us down, or will we put our lives in the, divi- in the hands of the divine love of Christ and live that life of love that is sun-tested, producing harvest? In the summer of 2017, my first marriage came to an end. It was gut-wrenching. It was painful. I still carry many of the regrets. 
That same summer, my mother was suffering from the advanced stages of dementia and lung disease, and she would not last very many more weeks. My father had just been diagnosed with a debilitating disease and needed nursing care, and we were unsure whether he would survive. The amazing part of the story is that my parents was my fa- parents' faith and their attitude. Through the hard times, they found a way to smile and find the good, even in the pain. My, my father made it two more years. In his final days, he was worried more about me than himself. He was constantly thanking the staff, the doctors, the nurses, his regular visitors that were a part of his day. In the nursing home facility where he lived out his last days, I could hear the other residents counting down a long list of complaints. Few of them were happy. But in his room, we talked about heaven, the grand reunion that was awaiting. There was a long list that could be counted in his room, but it was a list not of complaints, but full of blessings. Both my mother and my father loved me, despite my failures. I was blessed. In the middle middle of all this, in the summer of 2017, I started a new ministry at Buckingham United Methodist Church in Garland. I'd been out of the ministry for a few years, working for a company, doing management and leadership training, and doing financial and development consulting for churches. But I could not get away from God's call on my life to be a pastor in a church. And so Buckingham was my doorway back into ministry in the church. When I met with the church, I was worried about how my recent divorce and current life situation of running back and forth to Fort Worth in Pennsylvania to help uh, care for my mother and father would set with the church. I was honest with them. As I spoke, I tried to read the room. There was a lady I couldn't read at all. I thought to myself, she's probably going to have a problem with me. When I finished sharing how broken I felt and how undeserving I really sat there with them, thanking them for the opportunity, she smiled. With tears in her eyes, she said to me, it sounds like you need us as much as we need you. Now I was crying (laughs) when I responded to her, you have no idea how much that is true. And the celebration began. I found out later the deep pain in her life. Yet in those moments on that night, her love for me changed us both. Giving thanks counting our blessings and living in love acknowledges God in our lives and in our situations, even in the most difficult situation. We are not alone. Circumstances do not define us. Our faith defines us. The love of Christ defines us. Our living in sun-tested love defines us. And when things go wrong, giving thanks And offering love may be hard, but it prepares the way for the work of God in our lives. This Thanksgiving, I will give thanks for the legacy of faith that I have been blessed from the first breath that I took as a babe. I will give thanks for the countless people that have carried me when I was down. I will give thanks for all that has been done for me through the church and so many friends. I will give thanks for my parents, for my grandparents, for my wife Amy and the sweetness of her smile. I will give thanks for my children, and I will give thanks for you. For I am sure now more than any time in my life, we desperately need each other. We need each other. Here are a couple of other passages from Paul from other letters. 
In Philippians, later on in the letter, he says, In everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then one of my favorites from Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in every circumstance. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you and praise you. And we just place at your feet the difficult moments of our lives. And we ask this day as Thursday comes that you will give us eyes to see the blessings that are all around us. You will give us ears to hear the laughter and the, and, and the, the voices of those we love. That you would give us hands and feet to go about your work. May we live a life of sun-tested love and bear a harvest of love for you. Amen.